Our text this morning comes from Peter's second letter, chapter 3, continuing our series of sermons on this letter, and in the Pew Bible, that's page 1300. We're going to be focusing on the verses 3 through 7, together with verses 10, 10b through 13. So, just to help us with the context, we'll read the verses 1 through 13. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation." For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly." But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So far, our text, and like I mentioned, we'll be focusing on the verses 3 through 7 and 10b through 13. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, how good it is to be gathered together at last, at least in part, to worship our God together. How uplifting it is to sing God's praises in person. I'm sure what you felt at home was felt equally by myself and the duty elder here each Sunday. The singing just wasn't the same, not by a long shot. And how encouraging it is to have five of our young people waiting to stand before us this morning to publicly profess their faith in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Truly, we can say our God is good and gracious and kind to us all. But if the last ten or so weeks have taught us anything, it's that we have not yet come to the fullness of God's kingdom. We have not yet arrived at the glorious home of perfection which the Lord promises to give us, for which the Son of God gave His life. No, the coronavirus has shown us again that we live in a world of tears, of suffering, we live in a battlefield of brokenness. The whole world has been 
turned upside down, including church life, and we're not right side up yet. We're only part way back to regular worship services, and the world is only part way back to its regular routines. Death has come in certain areas of the world, quite a lot of death. Fear has come all over the world. Anxiety and uncertainty in many hearts, including in Canada and in our own church community. No one knows. No one can predict how things are going to unfold in the next month. And not meeting together all these many weeks, not fellowshipping in person, that has taken its toll on us. So it's very, very clear, if it, if it wasn't before, very clear that we're not there yet. We're not at that spot of perfection, at the place of complete victory and total rest in the presence of the Lord. But these five believe we're going to get there. We all believe we're going to get there. We believe that the Lord Jesus will take us all to our new home on the new earth. That's one of the things we all hold dear. It's also one of the truths that comes under attack by false teachers from time to time, as Peter warns us in our text. We receive a warning here in this passage, a warning so that you and I will not get derailed from the true faith, that we won't get derailed from walking in holiness with our God until we do arrive in our forever home. And so I proclaim to you this word of the Lord, pursue holiness in anticipation of your future home. Pursue holiness in anticipation of your future home. We'll see three th or two things, the burning of your old home and the emergence of your new home. Now, one of the lies that these false teachers Peter was warning his audience about, his readers about, one of the things they were teaching was that Jesus wasn't going to come back. Peter describes this in verse 3, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. You can hear the mockery in those words. And that, that whole tone and, and approach of mockery is right at home in 21st century Canada, isn't it? How often isn't one biblical teaching or another mocked and ridiculed online or in other media? If you stand up in any kind of public venue and say, I believe in the creation of the world in six days, according to what God describes in Genesis 1, you are laughed away as being unscientific, a fool who believes in myths. If you stand up against the transgender movement and say publicly there are only two genders, male and female, well, what happens? You get hated upon by all of Facebook and all of Twitter. That's what happened to J.K. Rowling this past week, actually the past month. This famous writer of the Harry Potter series, I don't think she's a Christian, but she just says this is ridiculous. There's male, there's female, and she is brutalized on Twitter. She's public enemy number one as far as the Twitterverse is concerned. It doesn't take much imagination then what would happen if we were to proclaim on Twitter or somewhere like that that people should repent and believe because Jesus is coming back soon to judge the living and the dead. You can hear the mockery coming. Oh, really? Your Savior is coming back, eh? 
You're sure about that? He's been promising that for 2,000 years. Your church has been preaching that for 2,000 years. Where is this Jesus? When are you going to wake up, man? Jesus is dead. He's not coming back. Don't be a fool. Statements like that and questions about our belief made in that mocking fashion, they, they make us look stupid, of course, but much worse, they tempt us from giving up those truths. They tempt us away from a holy lifestyle. You see, when these false teachers deny Christ's second coming, they're also at the same time denying any final judgment. That's why Peter emphasized in chapter 2, and we saw that over the previous weeks, he emphasized the reality, the certainty of coming judgment for those false teachers and their followers. And he does it again in our text, verse 7. The heavens are the, and the earth, he says, they are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, if you just think back a moment to chapter 2, we saw there quite clearly how those false teachers were indulging in a very unholy lifestyle. They gave in to all kinds of sexual sin, Peter tells us. They were filled with pride, with arrogance, with greed. And from their perspective, they would say, well, why not? Why not live this way? If there is no day of reckoning, if no one's going to hold me to account for the way I've been thinking, for the, what, the words I've said or the actions I've done, then just let me live the way I want to live. Que sera, sera, eat, drink, and be merry. Party on, dude. It doesn't really matter anymore what you do. This is where their false teaching led them to. It led them to a debauched life, an immoral life. So, brothers and sisters, remember, one of the promises you're going to make is that you believe the doctrine of Scripture and that you will reject any errors and heresies. You're going to throw them away. You've got to do that. Because if you don't, it could lead you into this kind of mess, this kind of wrong path like the false teachers, a lifestyle of immorality. For the truth is, Jesus is coming back as judge. And to prove that, how does Peter prove that? Well, he, he takes his Bible, which would have been the Old Testament Scriptures, just as he had done in chapter 2, and he goes back to what the, the prophetic word of Scripture says. And he does that because he tells us in verse 5, these false teachers, they deliberately have overlooked what the Scriptures say. We should pay attention to that too. It's not that they don't know what the Bible says about the coming day of the Lord. It's not that they haven't been taught what to expect. No, they purposefully set aside that knowledge and ignore it. You ever have that with, in conversation with people and you, you bring up a certain Bible passage and you say, look, it says right here that we're supposed to believe this or do this. And no sooner do you point it out to that individual than they basically ignore it and return to their own position. They deliberately overlook God's truth in order to keep their own ideas. We need to always submit to what the Word says. And Peter says, it, Peter it takes us right back to what the Bible says about creation. Apparently, the false teachers, they also were thinking about creation, but they didn't reflect on it sufficiently. Peter says, verse 5, they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. What's Peter saying? 
He's saying to these false teachers who, who claim to be Bible-believing people, he's saying, look, God has already shown once that he can powerfully affect the history of the world. Don't forget, it's he who made the world by his word. The heretics in Peter's day are suggesting that God and, and his Christ, they are far away from the earth. They've got nothing to do with the earth. And Jesus certainly didn't come back to the earth. And behind this lie is the notion, the idea, that God does not have the ability to come back in glory. God does not have the ability to stop all that's going on on the earth. God does not have the ability to render judgment of the world. Things are just going to go on and on like they've always done, they say. That too sounds familiar, doesn't it? We can hear voices, lots of them in our present-day society, say the world is just going to carry on. In fact, a lot of people believe in evolution, the theory, the, the religion of evolution, which believes that the world is evolving and humanity is evolving. Oh, yes, humanity is getting better, they say. I don't know what they say about the riots south of us, but humanity is getting better, says evolution. And if anybody, any pessimists among the unbelievers see an end to the world, then they think of a world maybe where nuclear bombs are falling from the sky and World War III blows up the, the planet. But nobody outside of the Christians, nobody thinks that Jesus is going to appear on the clouds as judge. That's a myth to them. Nobody thinks that they will have to give an accounting of everything they've ever done to a higher authority, to Christ Jesus. Even this worldwide pandemic has not shaken their belief that God is dead and that man is the captain of his destiny. There's not a news program that I'm aware of anywhere in North America that puts the pandemic down to a judgment of God warning the world of his future return. The warning is there, but it's not listened to. But Peter points back to two things, creation and then the flood. He brings that out in verse 6. And that by means of these, world, uh, the Word of God and water, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. It was flooded and it perished. You remember how that went. After the fall into sin, Genesis 3, mankind multiplied on the earth, spread abroad, but as they did so, also their sin multiplied. Their sin spread abroad. It came to the point where the Lord was grieved, says the Bible, that he had made man. Can you imagine? The Lord was upset that he had created man because of all the wickedness pouring out of man's heart and in his life. And so God brought judgment down upon the whole earth. God used water, the water that he had used at creation, to, to order creation, setting apart the land from the water, God now or then used water to undo creation and judge mankind. Well, you can see what Peter is driving at. He's basically reasoning like this. Look, if, if the Lord God, who created this world by His Word, later also judged the world in the flood, destroying it with water, do you really think he's incapable of doing that again? And then right on the heels of that, Peter goes on to speak of what's coming, verse 7, but by the same word, word of God, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter is perfectly in sync with the prophets 
which he's been referencing. One of those prophets being Zephaniah, which we read. Zephaniah writes, In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end, the Lord will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Judgment is coming. The prophets ring it out. Peter rings it out. One final horrendous judgment. Be warned. It surely is a warning to all of us, and the scoffers included, but even more than that, Peter wants to encourage the faithful believers. For he says in verse 11, since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, so all of the the elements on the earth, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? You see, the scoffers that he mentions, the false teachers, They were living for what? They were living for the pleasures of this life. That's what chapter 2 described. But Peter says, that's all going to be wiped out in the end. Do not live for something temporary, something that's here today, gone tomorrow, but look forward to something permanent and live for that permanent thing, that, that forever thing. Remember God's promise. To the five of you and to all of us, made to us at our baptisms, how the Spirit of God, and now I'm quoting, will present us without blemish, so without spot or wrinkle, the Spirit's going to present us among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. That's what Christ is working for and His Spirit is working for. We need to believe that and labor toward that. We all do, brothers and sisters. That's the permanent thing, to live life without blemish, not to indulge in sin. This earth, says our text, will be burned by fire. That means the place we now live, the... the The earth that we call our home is going to be consumed in flames. Peter repeats it a couple of times, verse 10. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's pretty powerful and pretty comprehensive language, isn't it? We've all seen pictures of forest fires raging around North America or other parts of the world. And we know that these forest fires, once they get going, they, they're, they're, they're out of control. You, they can't really be stopped. They have to kind of burn themselves out. And they can ruin tens, if not hundreds of thousands of acres in a very short time. And yet, as devastating as those forest fires are, they will not even compare to what the Lord will do on the day He comes back. He's going to set the entire globe on fire with such divine power that nothing will escape its fierce heat, not even the basic elements of the universe itself. We need to to think about that, brothers and sisters. What's coming there on the day of the Lord? You five need to think about it too. Everything that we experience and are familiar to us on this earth, your your house, your car, your truck, Tim, your neighborhood, the hockey arenas, the the malls, the basketball courts, your, your favorite hiking trails, the suburbs, the farm, You name it, this whole earth, this whole universe will be torched. That makes the things of this life temporary. It makes them fleeting. 
prioritize your life accordingly. Use these temporary things to serve the Lord and, and make yourselves ready for the permanent thing that's coming. For all of it's going to come under fire, but then all of it will be purged of its sin, and out of that fire will emerge our new home. That's what Peter describes as well. For as, as powerful and as destructive as the fire of God's judgment will be, yet we should not go too far and think that the earth will itself be no more. You might have got that impression reading through in the, the description of fire and perishing and destruction. And then verse 13, Peter writes since about looking forward to new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You might then have the idea that, that God is going to speak another word and another earth is going to pop into existence, another heavens. But that's not the case. Peter, by his own description, cannot mean that this creation is going to come to an end altogether. Look at how he uses the word perish in verse 6. He says, speaking of the flood, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now, that word for perish is the same word he uses for destruction. It's just translated in the English two different ways, but it's the same Greek word that he mentions in verse 7. The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So if you want to use the same word, uh, the world was destroyed with the flood, says Peter, and the world will one day be destroyed again in the fire of judgment. Now, when you think back to the flood we know that the flood did not annihilate. It did not disappear the earth. What did the flood do? It cleansed the earth of all the evil existing upon it, or at least as much as God could do with water. As God's wrath poured out over the earth, the ungodly perished. Most of the animal world perished as well. Certainly all the dry land creatures after the flood was over, the waters receded, and what was left, same earth. Only with all the changes the flood had made. Now, that's the picture of what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Only the Lord won't be using water, but he'll be using fire. The fire of God's wrath will purge this old world from all sin and evil once and for all. It'll be a complete cleansing. God's fire will do what the floodwaters could not do. The flood was, was, was limited in what it could do. It was limited because it only slowed down the problem of sin by reducing man's numbers and the numbers of the animals. It never solved the problem of sin. It didn't take sin away. No, that problem had to be solved by someone, a man, actually paying for the sin paying man's penalty. God's justice demanded that, that mankind suffer eternally for his rebellion. And since that penalty could not be met by any sinful creature, any, any person on the earth, God sent someone to the earth, his only begotten son. That was Jesus. He came and paid the penalty on our behalf. And now that Christ has come and the, the debt has been paid in full, the remnant of sin can be removed. It can be cleansed and destroyed forever. And God's going to do it through His holy fire, the greatest fire the world's ever seen. Like the flood, it will cover the globe, but Unlike the flood, it will burn up all things sinful in this creation, purging the earth of evil and leaving behind what is good. Think of how iron ore is manufactured. Iron ore as a, 
as a rock in itself is not very useful. But when it's set into the blast furnace and the hottest fire is applied to that iron ore, literally all the impurities melt away. And when the fire is, when it's pulled out of the fire, what is left is raw, pure, perfectly useful metal. Well, that's the kind of idea we've got going on here. That's what the Lord's fire is going to do on the last day. All the sinfulness of this creation will be burned up like dross. And when the fires die down, what will be left will be this creation renewed and revitalized and restored. This is what Peter is driving at in verse 10 when he says, and the works that are done on the earth will be exposed. He doesn't say annihilated or consumed, but exposed. The the sin will, will fall away, will be stripped away, and the original earth and the original heavens will come forth from the ashes for everyone to see. It'll be the same globe, same planet, only now transformed into the perfect creation it was always meant to be. That's what Paul is writing about, too, in Romans 8, which we read. He says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, here it comes. Hope of what? In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's not, the the creation is not going to be annihilated. It's going to be liberated. This creation, which has been twisted badly because of man's sin, will also come to experience the salvation of Christ and be free freed from all corruption. And you know, this gives us a a beautiful perspective on this present life and great incentive for our work for the Lord. Sometimes believers think when they they think about this coming fire, they think about the coming judgment of God, they think, well, what's what's the use? What's the point of working hard? What's the point of 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 sweating so much in this life, of of building up a nice home, of keeping our yards looking nice? What's the point of pursuing education? What's the the point of holding down a job? It's all going to be destroyed anyway, right? But when you understand that God's people will be set back on this same earth, made new, a renewed earth, where these earthly activities will in some way carry on, and we don't know how exactly they're going to carry on. The Bible doesn't give us those details, but every indication is that earthly life is going to continue. Earthly activities are going to continue. Earthly labor is going to continue only without sin. When you understand that, then what we're doing now is not a waste of time at all. This is our time of preparation. So my young brothers and sisters, find your place in this world and do your work in this life for the purpose of God's glory and consider this life that you're you're living as as a staging ground for the next life. It's practice. We are practicing what it means to live full, meaningful, holy lives in God's service so that when the end comes and we're finally put back down from the clouds, back down on the earth, an earth that's been cleansed, we will be ready. On that day, the Holy Spirit will finish what He's starting in us already now. He will cleanse our hearts, cleanse our bodies. Then we'll be set down on this cleansed earth. Sin will be no more, and we'll be ready. We'll all be ready to begin our new set of labors on the new earth with full energy and full joy and the full friendship of our God 
Keep that, brothers and sisters, in your minds. Keep that in your hearts. The five of you, as you live your faith out every day, prepare for what's coming. Doing that will make this life, the time, pass quickly. And it might even hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. Peter writes about that in verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Listen to that. Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Did you know that you can speed the return of Jesus? How do you do that? By paying more and more attention in your daily work, in your recreation, your time of relaxation, but also in your relationships, in your projects, in all, every area of life, paying attention to living for the Lord, living a holy life. As you produce the fruit of faith, you not only make your own calling and election sure in your own mind, as Peter writes about in chapter 1, but, says Peter now, you speed on the day of the Lord. That's all part of God's plan, part of His design in bringing about the end of this sinful world. We hear it in the Lord's Prayer, which we've been looking at in the Catechism recently. Your kingdom come, your will be done. When we pray that, we're, we're praying, Lord, hasten the day. And how does the kingdom of God advance on this earth? Well, it advances when we obey our king, when we submit our lives to the king's rule, when we are part of the process of, of spreading out the kingdom by speaking of it to others, by embracing Christ and living for our Savior. Then God's kingdom comes more and more. Until at last we'll hear the king himself shout from the clouds, I have come. Everything has now been prepared. Enter into the joy of your master, my faithful children. Amen. <laughs>